we have to start immediately because our first speaker will have to leave us at one o'clock. He has a commitment, and this is nobody else than the representative of the uh, European Union in Austria and former Secretary General, most powerful uh, person uh, in EU. And uh, we know that he has not only quite some experience, but also some perspectives for the future. And this is what we will listen to now. Martin Silmer, please. Thank you, Werner Fasslaben, for this very kind introduction. I'm the only real civilian on the panel, and he did everything to compensate for that. Thank you very much, <laughs> Werner. That, that was very kind of you. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, we are, want to talk about what the Zeitenwende means for the European security architecture. And I would like to set the scene a bit more generally before my NATO and uh, military colleagues uh, will complement uh, what is happening operationally. Um, I, I have six points on which I want to elaborate. Huh? The first one is what the Zeitenwende means for the European security, because that's our title today. And we should be, as Velina will confirm, also be a bit academic in our approach today and discuss the subject that we have been asked to discuss. Zeitenwende, ladies and gentlemen, what does a Zeitenwende mean? A Zeitenwende is a neutral term, because it simply means something changes fundamentally. It doesn't say whether it changes to the good or for the worse. It's I think we should sometimes see this also, also as an encouragement, because at the moment everything is bad and gloomy. A Zeitenwende can also be something what we make of it. Of course, when we look at the map, we have 500,000 soldiers, Russian soldiers, mobilized against their neighboring country, the biggest army of aggression in Europe since the Second World War. We have a country speaking openly uh, about the use of nuclear weapons, which is a taboo break on our continent, so, indeed, a lot is changing. The European Council called what is happening not a Zeitenwende, but a tectonic shift. A tectonic shift, because it means the fundamentals are changing. War is back in Europe, and that is particularly dramatic for our continent, which is, as it has been mentioned this morning, a continent of peace, a continent of freedom and security, and a continent of wealth and prosperity. We didn't have war between the 27 member states of the European Union for more than 70 years. Huh? This is a success in itself. Huh? It doesn't mean that we didn't have war in the world. We had a lot of wars in the world, but not between the 27 member states of the European Union. Therefore, for us, that this is happening in our neighborhood is such a big shock. Uh, and it is also a big shock because it calls into question the three pillars on which our security our wealth and our prosperity are built. And I say that notably in a German-speaking country. It would also apply in the other German-speaking country that I know also a little bit. The three pillars of our wealth and prosperity were cheap energy from Russia, China as the biggest market for our exports, and the United States of America pays for our security. That, ladies and gentlemen, is why we are such a prosperous and wealthy continent. And all three pillars are no longer stable. Huh? Two of them, one is broken, one is crumbling, and the last one, we don't know how long it will last. So we have to change a lot. Huh? Uh, and uh, that's why I think is the moment that what Zeitenwende means for us, and that's why Werner Fassler brought us together today, is a moment, is the geo moment of the geopolitical wake-up call for Europe. Huh? Uh, I was here invited last time three years ago, and Werner Fasselam had invited me to speak about the new commission, which called itself a geopolitical commission. I remember almost the same people were sitting in the room at the time. That's a good thing in Vienna. We always meet again. At the same time, many people were smiling and saying, OK, the commission got a bit ahead of itself. Why can't the commission be geopolitical? Schuster bleibt bei deinen Leisten, somebody says. Well, we have no choice but to be geopolitical today. That's what we have to do. Ladies and gentlemen, the second point I want to uh, address is what we mean at the moment when you speak about European security and our values, because that's what it, where it starts from. We are not only an economic community, not only a prosperous community, but the European Union is a community of values. And the current crisis shows that we have to reaffirm these values in an unprecedented way, because we have a war of aggression in our neighborhood that is breaching all taboos. So that's why we have three 
mantras that all 27 heads of state in government are repeating again and again in European Council conclusions and we all uh, as diplomats repeat in public and I will do this again. Huh? The first one is um, what we learn from this aggression that never again, and that's why we stand against Putin, never again must we allow on our continent that military force, brutal force is used to change borders. This is the lesson of the European peace project. That is why it started once between France and Germany making peace because we didn't want to be in trenches again against each other in the Alsace. That's, by the way, for all the Austrians who always criticize that Strasbourg is a capital of the European Union with the European Parliament. There's a reason for that, because Strasbourg is the symbol of German-Franco reconciliation that we don't shoot at each other in trenches. That is, and that we don't say this year it's on this side of the border, then it's on this side, and we have another 100,000 of our youngs who are killed, who are killing each other for just a couple of square meters. That is the lesson of the European history. Who doesn't understand this has to see uh, the military cemeteries uh, where you can inspect that all over Europe. Uh, and we must not allow this to happen again. That's why we need to stand against Putin. This is not any kind of war. Somebody is using his subjective perception of borders and history in Europe to redraw the map. If we start doing this, ladies and gentlemen, let's speak about Austria. Where is the infertile then? Huh? I was recently in a museum of history in Regensburg. I learned there, what I didn't know before, that there was a time when Tyrol belonged to Bavaria. Huh? God prevent that. Huh? But <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, joking aside, huh? if we start to interpret what we have today subjectively from our historical understanding where one something belonged, huh? well, then nobody is safe in Europe. Huh? What do I do, do then with the Burgenland, huh? which was Deutsch West Ungarn? Huh? What do I do with the border between uh, Oedenburg, Sopron, and the rest? Huh? I have many, many reasons if I look into the maps, and that is the success of our peace project that we overcame this. That's why we must not allow somebody in our neighborhood to change this again. Ladies and gentlemen, the second mantra, never again, is never again must we allow the law of the strongest or the law of a strong man to replace. Uh, the strengths of the law. Uh, and you may say, okay, Martin is a lawyer, so that's what he is bound to say. No, ladies and gentlemen, we all believe in the rules-based international order. And I hear sometimes people saying, the war of Putin means the end of the rules-based international order. I totally disagree with that. He is trying to end the rule-based international order. It is our duty to stand up and defend the rules-based international order. That's why I'm not saying I'm sorry to disagree with the Honourable Ambassador uh, of uh, Ukraine to the Council of Europe, even though I understand totally his frustration. No, the United Nations are not dead. There's not a failed system now. The United Nations Security Council has in many conflicts not managed to come to a view, and that is tragic, that is frustrating. But we need the United Nations system. We need the rule that the prohibition of aggression and of armed force, Article 2, Number 4, of the Charter of the United Nations. We need to come again and again to the Security Council, even though Russia will have a veto, but we have, they have to show up their hand against everybody else. And we have to go to the United Nations General Assembly to show that at the end of the day, the breach of the rule of international law is not defended by others. It's only Russia and a very few others like uh, Syria, North Korea, and Belarus. Huh? The latest vote in the General Assembly on the acceptance or condemnation of the annexation of the so-called so four so-called republics by Russia was very telling. Huh? It is not that here is half of the world and there's the other, ladies and gentlemen. No, there were only five or six countries voting with Russia on that one, because if we accept that somebody takes the territory of the neighbor by force, nobody is safe, not in Europe, nowhere in the world. And that's, I think, the, the second mantra that we repeat again, and we will go again to the General Assembly whenever a breach of international law by Russia happens. Huh? Because we need also to make clear it's a breach of international law. The European Union and its member state, Austria included, are at the moment at the International Court of Justice. It's very important that they do that. And you will say, why do you do that? It's a waste of time, there's a war. No, we need also to be clear that for the future, this must not happen. And we use here, uh, and uh, Ukraine did this to start with the International Genocide Convention. It's good to do that also to show to the future that this must never happen again. Last mantra, the most difficult for us Europeans, because at the end we have 30 years of peace since the end of the Cold War, and it's difficult for us to accept it, because what we always like to say, why don't we talk to each other? 
Why is nobody traveling to Moscow to make peace? Huh? We heard a bit the prospects from our Ukrainian colleagues, and I fully agree with them, ladies and gentlemen. We have to learn the lesson that never again must we, if somebody breaches international law, takes territory in our neighborhood, simply stand by and wait, like in 2008, like in 2014. Huh? Yes, from today's perspective, it was a mistake not to confront Putin at the time. Huh? There is a French saying that is, la petite vient en mangeant. You get more hungry the more you eat. Huh? And ladies and gentlemen, very cynically, this is exactly what is happening. That's why we have to stop Putin, and that's what the European Union and its member states and our allies around the world are doing. Huh? We had recently a summit of all 44 nations of Europe in Prague, the European Political Community Summit, and all of us, all were there except Russia and Belarus, they were, for reasons that you understand, not invited. All of them stood to these principles of the Charter of the United Nations uh, and of public international law. That's very important. Huh? On our European continent, we must never allow that borders are moved again by military force. That's what we're doing. So that's our starting point from a values point of view. Ladies and gentlemen, I come to the third point. The instrument to implement what we believe in are sanctions. And I know what I talk about in an Austrian audience where most people will tell me, not openly, but when we are outside <laughs> over coffee, say, ah, the sanctions, could you not take this person off the list? Uh, is this an, at the end, it's, a, it's an adversary of Putin. Or, this company is such a good company. It doesn't do, you really have to hurt it. Ladies and gentlemen, I understand all that. But what are sanctions? Why do we apply sanctions? Under international law, you apply sanctions as the second mean if you don't use military force in response to military aggression. All of us, all countries of the European Union, would be allowed to, at this moment in time, send their soldiers under public international law to Ukraine and fight together with Ukraine. Some may even say, I'm sure our Ukrainian colleagues will say, that's what they should do. Huh? Ukraine is using its right of self-defense under Article 51 of the United Nations Charter. Everybody who comes to the help of Ukraine supports them militarily or in other means is uh, legal, behaving legally under international law. So we could do that. But we have decided collectively, the global West has decided that everybody, including the United States of America, not to intervene in this conflict militarily, not to escalate it. Huh? This is quite a tough decision. Huh? I, I have difficulty looking my Ukrainian friends in the eyes when saying that, huh? Huh? because morally something else would be required. But we do that not to escalate a war with a military power that has nuclear weapons. Huh? If this is wise or not, history will tell us. Huh? But if you don't do that, if you don't intervene militarily, then the only other answer is sanctions. And our sanctions, ladies and gentlemen, they came fast, they came swift, Eight sanction packages adopted unanimously by the 27 member states of the European Union, all leaders. Huh? I sometimes wonder who were these leaders, because in some member states they have the feeling nobody was present huh, when this was decided. Huh? But you cannot just sit there in Brussels and say, do what you want, I'm not in the room, or you go outside and are on the phone. No, on sanctions you have to be in the room and say, yes, I'm in favor of that. You have to discuss them with your experts and you have to bring your view to the table, ladies and gentlemen. So all 27 are there. So for those who are not in favor of unanimity, I'm very much in favor of unanimity on this one, because nobody can hide and say, I wasn't part of this decision. It's necessary to have this, and that is our strength on that one, so let's therefore stand to them. These sanctions are very well calibrated. They are tough, huh? but they are also phased in. Huh? They could be much tougher. They could be much tougher, for example, on oil. The embargo against oil enters into force, ladies and gentlemen, on the 5th of December. Huh? So some people say, ah, they are not efficiently sanctioned. Russia is still earning money with, with the oil. Yes, they do because we decided in summer, on the request of several member states, only to make it operational on the 5th of December. What happens? Well, now everybody buys Russian oil until the 4th of December midnight, huh? and therefore uh, more, more money for Putin in these times. Ladies and gentlemen, that will finish on the 5th of December, but let's not say, as some people are saying, the sanctions have not been thought through. Yes, they have been thought through, and that, I think, uh, should be recognized by everybody also here in this country, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, the sanctions are efficient. Russia, Russia's ex, Rus, uh, imports to Russia from our most important, from Russia's most important trading partners, decreased fundamentally. Imports from the United States to Russia decreased this year by 85 percent, 85 percent, and that is not potatoes, ladies and gentlemen. That is mainly high technology machines, 85 percent from the European Union. 
we say, oh, the sanctions are so tough on us. Huh? Well, it was only 45% decrease. Huh? Only 45% of our export decreased to Russia. And China, ladies and gentlemen, that I find the most interesting one. All this you find in the economic report of the European Central Bank. These are facts uh, that have been analyzed. China's imports to Russia in the same period decreased by 23%. So, so we heard it before. The idea, China is a very clever power. It's a dangerous power, I believe, but it's a clever power. They never team up with a loser, ladies and gentlemen. That's the history of China. Uh, that should make us uh, think about this uh, uh, and should also make Vladimir Putin think. Ladies and gentlemen, therefore our sanctions are effective. The most effective sanction was the sanction on the reserves of the Central Bank of Russia. The reserves, just to give you an idea, why are these reserves important? The reserves is the foreign currency of Russia. It's with what you can buy weapons internationally. For example, Iranian drones. We froze of these assets of Russia 600 billion euro altogether, around, I'll do this easier to calculate, half of them were abroad, half of them were frozen by the European Union and our allies. So only 300 billion left. Of these 300 billion left, Russia has spent around 16% on military equipment. Of the rest, there is a lot in gold. Gold is under embargo, you cannot use it. There is a lot in special drawing rights of the international monetary funds. It's not very easy to make money out of this. So ladies and gentlemen, out of this you will see the faster we cut off the fossil fuel export of Russia, the faster this war will run out of financial fuel. And I think that is something what we always have to keep in mind when we discuss sanctions, ladies and gentlemen. I come to my fourth point. European security and economic solidarity within the European Union. Why do I need to mention that? It's a war between Russia and Ukraine, started by Russia, but it's also an economic war. Russia is waging an economic war against us. We are replying uh, to its aggression with sanctions. But in this war, Putin tries to divide us and weaken us because he believes that his autocracy is stronger than democracies when inflation becomes double digit. Uh, when suddenly energy prices come up. He thinks these people will give up, give up. It's a race against time, because at some point he will run out of money to finance his war. So he is trying to divide us, to weaken us, to split us. And that's why we do everything as European Union, and it's probably our strongest instrument in this time to win this war, together with Ukraine, to strengthen our economies, to strengthen our energy supplies in a crisis on the energy markets caused by Putin's manipulations and by his sabotage of uh, important uh, uh, pipelines to the European Union. What we do is four things. We have stored together the European Union. We have stored gas. I remember when we decided this in spring to store gas for the first time in the history that in Europe there is a law that we store gas. It was never necessary, not during the Cold War. We have done this on oil uh, some time ago after the oil crisis. We store gas. Everywhere in Europe, in all available gas storage, we have decided to do that. It's a legal obligation, and all member states, even though many said it's not possible, have fulfilled it. We have now, in Europe, more than 95% of the garage, so it's basically full, which you see what this does to the gas price. We have, at the moment, still liquid natural gas coming in at the harbors of Spain. They are queuing up there. And the reason that they're queuing up there and there's not enough storage immediately available leads to a situation that there were for hours this week and last week, suddenly the, gas, the wholesale gas price was negative huh? because it didn't find anybody. So, ladies and gentlemen, we will not freeze this winter. Huh? Huh? We have to continue to save and to be solidarity with each other, but Europe has done its job to prepare for this winter. Huh? No reason for complacency. There's another winter and another winter coming, but I think the first chapter we managed well. We have started now also to pool our energy purchases. Huh? We will next year purchase around 15% of energy together if all member states follow the European Commission's proposal, but it looks very promising. That makes a lot of sense. When you fill your gas storage, the most expensive, we saw this this summer, that's when the prices went ballistic, when everybody tries to fill the last 10 to 20% of the gas storage. Yeah? Then everybody is racing for that, everybody is outbidding each other, the prices go up. That's why we had prices above 300 euro per megawatt hour. What we're doing now, for next year, to combine this, uh, at least 15%, to buy them together, to have a gas purchasing consortium uh, that combines our power, that prevents outbidding. Uh, so not allowed to be split, combine our strengths uh, 
Huh? OPEC is an oil producers cartel. We have now a gas purchasers cartel, ladies and gentlemen, because that's what we need temporarily during this crisis. We need to save together. We need to save energy, ladies and gentlemen. Huh? I'm, I'm happy to see that the temperature is here hopefully not above 19 degrees. Huh? We all heat it up uh, ourselves with uh, our warm hearts here in this room, and I think that makes a lot of sense. If all public billion, if everybody in the European Union does this, not go drop the heating above 19 degrees Celsius, then we could save the whole energy consumption of Austria uh, together. Huh? So that, I think, this is a figure. Huh? Let's do this together. It makes sense, and we have now European energy saving obligation, and they work. Huh? In uh, August and September each month, we consumed on gas, 15% less in August and in September, each time 15% less than the average of the last previous five years. So we are doing something to not only increase supplies by additional purchases, but also to reduce the demand. And lastly, what we're doing together is sharing, ladies and gentlemen. We share. We are a solidarity energy union. It's difficult to say that because sometimes I hear, I was recently in the Montafon in beautiful Vorarlberg. It's really a beautiful region. And there was somebody giving a tough speech and said, the electricity produced in the Montafon is for the Montafonas. He didn't mean by that the neighbors of Austria. He meant Vienna, of course. So he's saying not a cent of the electricity goes to Vienna. I think the Austrians understand uh, what the rivalries here between East and West are. But joking aside, huh? no, that is not the policy. Montafon first, uh, Austria first, Germany first, France first. No, we will not survive that. Huh? If you start doing that, then the lights will go out in Europe because we have an interconnected gas and electricity market. So the best answer to Putin is to combine, to work together, to share. Austria is the best example. The east of Austria is dependent of its neighbors. The west of Austria is supplying the south of Germany. So let's work all together. Uh, and uh, who sees what at the moment happens between Germany and France knows how important that is that we do this with our neighbors, regardless from what source electricity comes from. That is now a very dangerous sentence to say in Austria, but I say it nevertheless. Uh, because even in Austria, sometimes the source of energy is part of the energy mix that is imported in these times of crisis. We need to share, we need to be solidarious. In 2017, uh, because of the lesson of a previous gas crisis in 2009, we had an energy solidarity regulation in Europe that is in force today that says every country should, with their neighbor, conclude a solidarity agreement on gas to make sure that in terms of a shortage, we help each other out on storage, on supplies. When we looked at the beginning of this crisis, how much have member states implemented? It didn't look very promising, ladies and gentlemen. We only work together in crisis. That seems to be very human behavior. Even today, we could have, if you look at the borders, we could have 40 solidarity agreements in Europe. We have only six. So when this happens, the European Commission needs to intervene. We have now proposed a solidarity by default rule. Everybody who will not have concluded by the end of the year a solidarity agreement, there will be a European regulation that will impose solidarity because otherwise our internal energy market doesn't work. So solidarity on economic and energy supplies is the call of the day. Ladies and gentlemen, that brings me to my fifth point, energy solidarity and European defense. What we are learning in these days I said it before, that we have outsourced our security for far too long. We have not invested enough in security in Europe. We served us very well. That's the peace dividend. Huh? The peace dividend that we invested in education, in digital, in research, 30 years, ladies and gentlemen. I'm not saying this is over, but at least we need a rethink. Huh? Minister Tana said what Austria is spending in, it, in its increased uh, military budget, and I think this is very, very impressive. The same what is happening now in Germany, where this is the real Zeitenwende. If you look at the figures, the Commission put them on the table in May, what happened in Europe and in the rest of the world on military spending between 1999 and 2021. So a period of 22 years, 1999 to 10, uh, 2021. The military spending of all EU countries together increased during these 22 years by 19%. So there's less than the inflation rate during this time, which was very low. At the same time, in the United States of America, in the same 22 years, military spending increased by 66%. So they were a bit above the inflation. Russia, at the same period, increased its defense spending, its military spending, by 200 92%. China in the same period by 592%, ladies and gentlemen. 
Therefore, I fully agree with what the Minister of Defence said before. We are at the moment not in an armament race when we add a bit of money to the defence budget. We are making sure that our basic defence needs function, because they do not at the moment. We are too weak. Huh? Uh, we are too weak, and uh, therefore we need to make sure that our helicopters fly and that our tanks work with modern technology and are able to talk to each other over the borders. The European Union, as such, all 27 member states together invest around 50% of the US military budget in defence spending, but we are only 25% as efficient. One of the main reasons is that we not work together across borders and use econo economies of scale. Only 11% of defense spending involves two or three more countries. Everybody buys in their corner, ladies and gentlemen. That has to stop. The European Commission has put a strong call on that on the table of the European Council. I'm glad to say that all member states agree on that. We want to bring this up to at least 35%, but that's a long way to go. As we are in Austria, ladies and gentlemen, let me say a word on the defense for the dream that some have, that at some point our defense would be organized by a European army. I know if I don't say it, the question will come anyhow, and therefore I will say it. I have to say, the fans of the European army are mostly limited to Austria. Because in the rest of the European Union, most people know we have a European army already. That is NATO. And what we have to do within NATO to have a strong European pillar that takes its responsibilities, that is operational, and I think that is what we're talking about between EU and NATO cooperation that worked particularly well since 2017. But, ladies and gentlemen, to build up separately to that one, another organization, I think there is neither a demand for that, nor would it make military sense. Our best defense is NATO, and that applies also to Austria, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very sure that if ever Austria were attacked, that not only the mutual defense clause in the EU treaties would support Austria and all other EU member states would support it, but that also NATO would be supportive. I'm very sure about that, ladies and gentlemen, because we don't leave anybody behind. And this is not the so-called Trittbrettfahrer, as some say that. Now, everybody contributes, and I can confirm what the Minister of Defense said before, Austria is an extremely constructive player, not only with its more than 800 soldiers in EU and other international missions abroad, but also now in all decisions that we take on Ukraine. Also, our military and logistic support to Ukraine, Austria is part of it. When we reach the point where Austria and its constitutional neutrality cannot go one step with us, for example, to supply really lethal weapons, then Austria exercises its right that it has and its duty under the EU treaties to use the, the, the constructive abstention, which Austria does. This is constructive, not blocking the others. And Austria takes a higher burden than on the other equipment, for example, petrol that we deliver to Austria. Therefore. Um, Austria does what is possible uh, under the Austrian constitution and is extending it as much as possible as a loyal member of the European Union. So there are no reasons to complain about that. Huh? Uh, we also respect the constitutions of our member states, ladies and gentlemen, as they evolve. I come to my last point, ladies and gentlemen. European security and democracy. You may be surprised that I speak about democracy in this context. But I think it is our strongest instrument in the current conflict. Putin has chosen the 24th of February to invade Ukraine and start an unprecedented war because he believes that democracy is weak and fragile and decadent, that the European Union is disunited, a weak organization. He never took it seriously. He also didn't believe that the United States of America would be capable of anything after Afghanistan. He drew the wrong lessons of that. So what we have to demonstrate now every day, and I think so far we are succeeding, that the European Union and its ally are acting fast, united, and efficiently on the basis of our values. I think so far we have succeeded. Some say we have reached the limits. I wouldn't say so. I think it depends very much on the behavior uh, of Putin in the coming months. But what we should not make is the mistake to follow Putin's logic. Yes, it is true that in democracies, it sometimes takes longer to arrive at a decision. But what we do in democracies, there is not one person who rules and imposes his will on everybody else regardless of what they think. Yes, that takes sometimes time to take others into account, notably if you are a club of 27, which have different constitutions. But when you do that, the end result is a compromise. 
And a compromise is not a dirty word. A compromise is the sign of our strengths, that everybody can be on board. Everybody has conceded something, but together we are stronger, ladies and gentlemen. And I would wish that we all consider ourselves, it was said before, we are multipliers here in these rooms in the coming months as ambassadors of democracy. When we hear this government party has done this or this opposition party, they're all stupid, they're all failures, they're all total disasters. Let's think twice if this is really the right way to speak about it. Yes, we can be critical and we should be critical. That's part of democracy. But let's not destroy each other. Let's see that, and I would say, in none of the 27 capitals of the European Union, I see at the moment somebody who's not doing its best to their abilities to make sure that we get out of this crisis stronger than before. So let's, this game of government opposition is very important because it leads to good results. But let's not destroy the other side. That, I think, is very important in today's context. There are no losers in democracies. There are only winners, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for your interest. Yeah, Martin Silmer, thank you very much for your very inspiring uh, speech. I think nobody could imagine that a bureaucratic organization like EU can produce such a lively uh, personality. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he is part of my hope, you know, <laughs> what, what European Union will develop in the future. Okay, thank you so much. You gave us already the password, and I think now uh, we come to a very interesting point. And this very interesting point is, of course, the speech of Nicola De Santis about NATO. Because NATO is something, you know, that in Austria usually is a little bit underneath the carpet. Even when we are, when we are talking about NATO partnership for peace, in Austria people only talk, are talking about partnership for peace. <laughs> NATO is uh, somehow, even if it is there, not always existent. Now, please, Nicola, you give us the word. Thank you, Werner, and I would like uh, to thank you for inviting me, and of course, the Austrian Institute for European Security Policy, the Martin Centers, and the Diplomatic Academy for uh, making it possible and organizing this event. Uh, there's different, you ask me to, you know, talk about NATO and how it fits uh, in this new security environment, one that we could define the post-Cold -post War security environment. And there's different ways to do this. Uh, of course, the way I came uh, on, the, on the plane yesterday, I was thinking on how to do it, but after the panel with, uh, you know, the former Prime Minister of Ukraine, uh, Timoshenko, the former minister, and uh, the vibrant discussion that there was before, I have to modify a little bit uh, this approach. One thing that the former Prime Minister Timoshenko said uh, struck me very much, uh, that nobody had thought, had foreseen that there could be war in Europe again. And I want to explain NATO starting from this point. I think it's very important because a lot of people have ideas about NATO, but the facts about NATO continue not to be well known. And this is the case not only in Austria, but you will be surprised in member countries, founding members of NATO, like the country I come from, Italy, it continues to be a recurrent issue because, of course, when you deal with security, when you deal with military affairs, sometimes ideology kicks in and misperceptions are originated by debate. So let me try and uh, answer this uh, question. Uh, why we were not thinking that, Europe would, that war in Europe would be possible again? NATO has just approved four months ago the fourth uh, strategic concept uh, following the end of the Cold War. The first one in November 1991, when I joined the international staff work with Jamie Shea, actually, um, actually worked for Jamie Shea at the time, um, was a 
document which for the first time NATO made public. The strategic concept until November 1991, which had been, of course, uh, regularly updated because that's what you want from a security organization, that it looks at the security environment and tries to adapt the way in which it will defend its members, in which it will provide uh, the security to the member countries and the people which are part of, of the alliance. In November 1991, we made it public. It was revised and made public. And if you look at it, it outlines a new vision of Europe, a, a, a vision of inclusion. It's a security concept which was inclusive rather than exclusive. It would be aimed at bringing into a new security order, one which would replace the Cold War order, everybody. And Russia, I want to undermine this, Russia, as well as the, all the successor states of the former Soviet Union and the Central and Eastern European emerging democracies, Russia was included into the security equation. In November 1991, with the strategic concept, we created the North Atlantic Cooperation Council, which was a way in which all of these countries could come to NATO and discuss issues of security concern. So there would be political dialogue, but there would be practical cooperation. We created a work program. Russia was not marginalized. In 1994, part of this evolutionary process, the, the, the North Atlantic Cooperation Council was a pan-European multilateral body. We launched in 1994 the Partnership for Peace, of which Austria is a member. The Partnership for Peace was a bilateral program to promote three things, democratic control of the armed forces, transparency of defense budget, and interoperability. This was the way in which NATO, in an area which is its added value, which is security, would contribute to the democratic evolution of the countries that came out of the Warsaw Pact. And Russia was offered that possibility. Democratic control of the armed forces meant that armed forces in democratic countries are under civilian oversight of the military. Transparency of defense budget means that in democracies, defense budget are discussed in parliament, where also the opposition has a say in, in, which, in the way in which human and financial resources are allocated to promote the security concept of a country. Third, the interoperability, the possibility for countries par part of the partnership for peace to work together to manage whatever crisis through interoperability would happen in European security. One year after, Bosnia happened. One year after, Bosnia happened. And what, what NATO did at the time, because we're talking about now the return of a conflict in, in Europe. Of course, we're talking about the Euro-Atlantic area now. But war erupted in Europe in Bosnia, which the potential spillover was very high at the time. Jamie remembers this very well. And NATO, another thing that nobody, and I never see this in the debate, nobody remembers that NATO implemented the military addendum of the Dayton Accord on the basis of a UN Security Council resolution with Russian troops on the ground. We had in the most secretive part of NATO, which is the military headquarters in Mons, in a Russian planning cell together, shoulder to shoulder, planning a military operation together with NATO. In Kosovo, 1999, it happened the same thing. Russia was against the air campaign of NATO, but when the UN Security Council resolution was given, again, on the ground, the K-4, the, the Kosovo force, was implemented by NATO troops and Russian troops together. To tell you how this offer of cooperation was not theoretical, for Russia, it was very practical, was very organized. So on one end, 1997, I was forgetting. 1997, Boris Yeltsin and the heads of state and government of NATO countries signed the founding act, which created a permanent joint council, a bilateral body for cover, political dialogue and practical cooperation in the security sphere with Russia. Okay, so the inclusion of new members in NATO, I don't like the term enlargement, don't use it. Don't you, although we did use it, <laughs> but I don't like it. I don't like the term expansion because it gives the wrong idea. Your minister was talking about, uh, Minister Tanner, about disinformation being a challenge. Well, we need to fight disinformation with a facts-based information. And uh, uh, Russia was, and NATO de developed uh, a uh, bilateral council in which they would meet regularly, and in the founding act there were a number of areas for cooperation together. 
And that council evolved in 2002 into the NATO Russia Council, which from a bilateral body became a multilateral body in which Russia was given equal footing. Of course, it was not a member of NATO, but in this tailored, I would say, cooperation, was given equal footing to the others because it was chaired by the Secretary General uh, of NATO. And in 2002, it was put in to sign off the founding act and participated in the, in the ad hoc summit, and we started meeting uh, you know, with the NATO Russia Council. NATO had two offices in Moscow. I mean, did you know that? That NATO had a office which depended on our division, the public diplomacy division, a military liaison mission, and so forth. So the idea that NATO marginalized uh, uh, Russia is wrong. And the idea that there was an expansion, the way it is presented, in other words, NATO decided in Brussels, in the NATO Council, now we're going to expand there, we're going to go in this country, and so No, it was the legitimate request of democratic countries to be part of an international organization. And that is something that cannot be frustrated, because nobody can dictate to any country to which organization, international organizations, they, they want to be. And then in 2007, something happened. The speech of Munich at the Munich Security Conference of Putin, in which he turned this area of cooperation into one of confrontation. NATO moved with the end of the Cold War from confrontation to cooperation in the security sphere in a variable geometry in which you would have countries that progressively would be included within the alliance being prepared. Other countries like Austria, part of Partnership for Peace, uh, you know, so we have a tailored. We have partnership with countries in the Mediterranean and in the Middle East. Today, we have partnerships with uh, countries in the Indo-Pacific. So this approach of cooperation, because of course, the three core security functions, among the three core security functions, you have cooperative security. I will come back to this because I, I still want to talk about what the panel says, which is NATO EU. But of course, before the discussion, I didn't want to look like a Martian. You know, everybody's talking about Ukraine, about security. Now I start talking about the complementarity between institutions. It's part also of this discussion. But 2007, Putin gave a different view. Democracies are obsolete. Uh, look at uh, there's only one power which is expanding its power uh, worldwide, and this has to be resisted. 2008, Georgia. 2014, Crimea. Today, Ukraine. There was the big miscalculation. This military outrageous uh, attack against sovereign country, not only targeting military forces, but deliberately targeting civilians, has shattered the peace in Europe. And that's why the new security concept of NATO talks about something totally different. The previous three were talking about the fact that the possibility of conventional attack had receded significantly. Today we talk that the Euro-Atlantic area is at war, a war of aggression. And I want to clarify, the moral responsibility of NATO countries and NATO as an institution is to support Ukraine. We don't want to be, NATO doesn't want to be, and our heads of state and government have been repeatedly clear, we don't want to be part of this conflict. But what we want to do, we want to help a country which is the victim of an illegal, a brutal aggression to exercise its self-defense, uh, which is enshrined into and in, uh, in sanctions by the UN Charter. And to do that, you cannot do it only with blanket, you cannot do it only with the winter clothing, which would be important as the winter, but you do it by denying the aggressor the, uh, the possibility to win this conflict. This conflict cannot, it will not be won militarily. And the future of Ukraine has to be decided by the Ukrainians. Whatever settlement, there will have to be a settlement. I cannot, uh, you know, uh, before our Ukrainian friend was talking about the, the, the difficulty to predict the future, the sentence he said was Chernomir, then others believe it was a famous uh, U.S. Uh, you know, baseball player who invented, there's nothing more difficult to predict than the future. He turned philosopher, by the way, and that's how he came. So there's different origins, but it's true. We cannot foresee how this conflict will end, but it will have to end. But it cannot be, uh, it, it cannot end this with others deciding the future of Ukrainians. It is Ukraine which will decide its future. And now the complementarity, because it was, I think, what we were supposed to talk before this discussion when I, when I was invited, between NATO and the EU. In November 1991, if you read the strategic concept, 
NATO made it clear that the emerging of a European security and defense identity reflected into the strengthening of the European pillar within NATO were reinforced transatlantic solidarity and cohesion. It was clear the way, the way of complementarity of efforts between NATO and the EU. And we structured it. The, the best way to structure this on a practical level was what was called the Berlin Plus, an agreement through which, uh, uh, an agreement signed actually by Lord Roberts and Secretary General, and the former Secretary General uh, Solana, uh, in which it was called the uh, agreement on the release, monitoring, and recall on NATO's assets and capabilities, the general you know, uh, knows this very well, which means that NATO will give assured access to NATO's capabilities whenever the EU would decide to act. At the beginning, it was conceived for the WEU, the Western European Union, another institution nobody mentions anymore, nobody remembers. But anyway, now it's uh, the EU which decided to take on the uh, ESDP, the, EU security, the European Security and Defense Policy, and therefore NATO would put its assets and capabilities, like we're doing now, for example, with Operation Altair. It was mandate, it was the UN Security Council just renewed. So, complementarity there, but complementarity also with, in terms of political and practical cooperation. We have today 47 areas of cooperation between NATO and the EU. We have had the two uh, NATO-EU declarations which define the strategic partnership between NATO and uh, the EU. And uh, this uh, cooperation, of course, has been extended to Ukraine. It's been extended to Ukraine. The compliment, you, you have seen right uh, in February, as the crisis erupted, uh, the, uh, term, the president of the commission, the president of the European Council, coming to NATO headquarters, meeting together with the Secretary General. You have had synchronization of meetings of heads of state and government. And we have had the meeting of foreign ministers of defense. And we have also our committees, which prepare for the work of the council, the, in, both in the EU and, uh, and in NATO to meet regularly. So we have developed also a culture of cooperation synergies, like you asked us to describe, between these two institutions. And this is what is happening today. And this is crucial to uh, end this war in Ukraine, because the sanctions of the European Union, coupled by the help that the individual member countries of NATO are providing, using NATO's assets and capabilities, using the experience of interoperability that has uh, been developed with Ukraine through the distinctive partnership that we have had for years with Ukraine, is also helping in this complementarity of effort. The two institutions help this country brutally illegally attacked by Russia. The strategic concept, of course, talks about also, uh, I spoke about cooperative security, but it spoke, speaks about deterrence and defense. The fundamental role of NATO, now go back to what my predecessor said about the European Army and so forth, the fundamental role of NATO is to protect its member countries. So the other part, while on one end we're helping Ukraine exercise its right of self-defense, we're also preparing to, we are defending, we're making sure that Putin understands that NATO will have the resolve to defend its member countries should they be attacked. We may, we proceeded to the major reinforcement since the end of the Cold War with 40,000 troops put in the eastern member countries of NATO so that also deterrence works. In other words, uh, you have to show in terms of deterrence uh, that the credibility of defense, uh, and that's why NATO's capabilities are its credibility. This is capability development, this is another area of cooperation with the EU, not only in complementarity between the member countries, but also to help partner countries of the EU in the security and defense sphere. And this is extended to different areas, hybrid, cyber, maritime security, and so forth. Final point is that all of this complementarity between NATO and the EU in dealing with today's uh, a crisis that we have seen developing, uh, I would say, in practice uh, over the years is also the key for the future because we don't know what our future we will have. 
But we know that the only way to deal with the current crisis, with the future crisis, and the possible spillover from adjacent areas of the alliance, in the strategic concept, we talk about a 360 degree approach, which means that NATO, while it focuses, of course, on the defense of its members on the Euro Atlantic area, has to take into account the developments which are coming before. And that's why we're outside the, the, the area of responsibility in an area of strategic interest. And that is why you here you have seen in the strategic council for the first time to talk about China. While we defined for the first time after a three a strategic concept, uh, again, Russia as a threat to your Atlantic security, we also define China as a challenge to, uh, to the security of the European uh, and the transatlantic family of democratic nations. And why is it this? Because it is unclear what is the intention of China. But we see what it's doing, cyber, um, uh, hybrid uh, activities. It is building up uh, capabilities in nuclear, in the missile uh, deliberation. I remember when I was in charge of the Middle East a few years ago, that we were wondering, why is it that China is building these big transport ships? They were saying um, that this was because they have a lot of migrants, and one day there will be a crisis around the world. They have to send the ships. You know, I come from Rome, and I remember the Roman Empire. You know, the Roman Empire used to send engineers uh, in the provinces, but after the engineers, we had the legions going there. So you don't know. There is a big question mark on the intent and the real intentions of China, but of course, its coercive policies, the way in which it's using cyber and ivory threats, doesn't make us sleep, uh, I would say, calm, uh, calm sleep. So, Again, uh, I wanted to touch upon the, these issues, try to uh, put the facts straight on the way the, we have come to this situation, and the role that the transatlantic community and the two major institutions which represent uh, the transatlantic community, NATO and EU, can continue to, to be a source of security and stability in an unpredictable security environment. Thank you. Nicola, thank you so much for your presentation, and also I'm sure that uh, you managed to bring the NATO concept also to the Austrian public a little bit closer, at least, <laughs> even if it is only centimeters. Uh, it certainly was already a step forward. Thank you so much. And now, of course, I do not envy uh, the third speaker, we are very proud of him. You know, he uh, made a typical exceptional career within uh, Austrian military, starting with military academy, uh, and then, of course, different posts, you know. Uh, he led two, two international missions before he became uh, then uh, the General Chief of Staff of uh, the Austrian Army, and as such, uh, now it's almost exactly one year ago, uh, General Briga changed to Brussels, and there he is leading uh, the military commission. As you can imagine, not an easy job having NATO immediately uh, nearby on the one hand. On the other hand, also, uh, if we, as we have heard, you know, uh, all those different questions coming up uh, within EU. And uh, you only can be sure, you know, he is a very sober military man. He is analyzing every problem very <laughs> exactly and softly. And now we are therefore looking forward to his analysis. Where does NATO stand? Where are uh, these relations? Uh, what will be the future development? General Brieger, please take the floor. Thanks a lot, dear Werner. Uh, yep. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for this opportunity to share with you uh, some thoughts uh, what the European Union uh, should do uh, in the context of the uh, crisis uh, in Ukraine, but not only the crisis in Ukraine, uh, because we all know that uh, 
there was a te tectonic shift, as it was already mentioned, and uh, a wake-up call also uh, for Europe and the world that uh, conventional war is, is waged uh, in midst uh, our continent. And uh, so I, within my uh, short intervention, uh, will try uh, to depict uh, some measures, some tasks for the European Union, for the uh, common uh, security and defense policy, how to tackle uh, this new situation, these new uh, geopolitical challenges. And uh, first of all, and it's, it's uh, often mentioned by many analysts, there is uh, uh, this uh, strive for more strategic autonomy. So uh, we all know the European Union um, has uh, had a good phase of uh, consuming um, the benefits of the Cold War period. Um, and now things have changed dramatically and we uh, have to have uh, this uh, we, we should overcome these dependencies uh, of, of uh, resources uh, from abroad. This is not done in, in weeks and months, but we have to reduce them. And this uh, uh, striving for more strategic autonomy is not only a military-focused undertaking. The goal must be to reduce the geostrategic dependency, but at the same time, strategically advanced technology and armaments industry within the European Union. One example, uh, and China was mentioned uh, repeatedly uh, uh, during our uh, conference, uh, Chinese inputs and products manifests itself in producing two of three batteries used in Europe and 90% of rare earths, just as, as one example. So we have to broaden our uh, supply of and uh, the providers of supply and uh, strategic autonomy goes from strengthening military uh, capabilities within the European Union member states to achieve a clear defined autonomy in order to deepen the common uh, security and defense policy and that is starting with a clear C2 structure and uh, a shortening of decision making processes. So. We need the capacity to make informed and uncoerced decisions. Such strategic autonomy not only requires the political ambition, but also the actual means and capabilities to underpin it. With this uh, term, uh, there are certain sensitivities related to, uh, in particular, to the transatlantic uh, relationship. However, the global strategy of the European Union continues by clarifying uh, such priorities are best served when the European Union is not alone and is best served when the international system-based rules and our multilateralism are served. So, Multilateralism is a priority within the European Union and has a major impact on how the Union deals with conflict and crisis. When it comes to conflict prevention, uh, this is the classic uh, task sharing with NATO, so we are or could be seen as the first responder, while uh, within the alliance uh, there is a focus on national defense uh, and common defense, of course. And uh, to uh, closely uh, depict our uh, strategic uh, vision uh, where the uh, European Union should move, uh, I, I come to the short uh, presentation on the strategic compass. The strategic compass is uh, adopted in March this year. It was uh, a product of analysis uh, uh, before the Ukrainian war, but it has been uh, integrating some aspects uh, and lessons learned uh, which, are, uh, which are in our minds now. Uh, so it's a rolling basic document, so to say, and presents concrete and realistic uh, measures to take 
80 uh, different projects within uh, this document and uh, 50 of these 80 projects should be accomplished this year. So the starting point has been a comprehensive uh, threat uh, analysis which has uh, to be renewed all every two years. There are basically four pillars uh, describing the whole range of tasks uh, for a future robust common defense and security policy. First pillar, act. The core of this pillar is the establishment of a rapid deployment capacity with about 5,000 troops to strengthen the command and control system and to increase the military mobility, uh, a project with uh, a very close interaction with NATO because it's of common interest in Europe uh, to make it happen that troops can uh, move swiftly uh, from one border to the other and to make use of the European peace facility as a, a financial instrument uh, to, uh, to insert uh, these, these developments. The second pillar, secure, uh, means we have to enhance our resilience and secure the access to uh, strategic domains. So we have to develop new tools uh, to fight cyber threats and uh, at the same time enhance our uh, ability to save the infrastructure, to protect also space assets and to enhance, not to forget, nav naval presence in area of strategic interests. And this is uh, an upcoming uh, necessity. Uh, third pillar deals with invest uh, and uh, this is what uh, the High Representative Borrell often uh, portrays as we have to spend more and better. Uh, we, we should commit substantially to enhance defense expenditures, but not only to enhance the expenditures, but uh, to spend more in research. This should be uh, about 35%, at the moment it's 8% uh, of the whole defense expenditure. And uh, for this reason, there is to be create uh, a defense innovation hub within the European Defense Agency. And we should uh, create new incentives for new financial solutions. And uh, I think we, we took a uh, essential step in supporting the Ukraine uh, in using the European Peace Facility for financing <coughs> needs for, um, for um, delivering uh, goods uh, and, and military means to Ukraine. And last <coughs> uh, aspect is partnering. So uh, as we all know that uh, no crisis can be tackled by one, one single country or one single organization, so we uh, have to uh, look at common challenges in a, in a common method. We have to strengthen the EU-NATO strategic partnership and EU-UN cooperation. We should boost the bilateral partnerships and build capacity uh, in Eastern and Southern partners as well uh, as, as uh, Western Balkans. So, uh, all in all, this uh, strategic compass uh, is a, a mixture of, of tasks and timelines and also conceptual aspects we, we have to follow. And it's a clear roadmap for the common security and defense policy for the next years. Um, in this context, there is, of course, the need of more military advice um, and expertise. And this is one of, of uh, the tasks of the military committee, to provide expertise uh, for the political echelon uh, to, um, to better tackle crisis and uh, to insert military means uh, if if necessary and possible, uh, to, um, uh, to come along uh, with the situation. 
the moment has come uh, when we cannot permanently rely on others uh, when it comes to security policy matters. In this uh, context, uh, I have uh, a small disagreement with uh, Mr. Selmayr because I'm of the opinion there is no uh, NATO army, there are NATO allies, uh, and there is also no European army at the moment. So there are the armies of the member states, and both organizations are, um, are based on the single set of forces. Uh, this is uh, the Austrian Bundesheer uh, for a, a small European member state or the, the French army for a, a big NATO and EU member state. So it's, it's a political question and also a question of the strategic analysis uh, in which context uh, these forces are uh, uh, to, be, uh, to be used. Um, and therefore, uh, this is uh, not a, a question of uh, a competition. It's, uh, uh, it's all about, a, uh, in, in the spirit of partnership, uh, to, to have uh, the, the strengths and the weaknesses on both sides uh, we can compensate. For instance, the European Union uh, uh, is uh, a, a, very, a very broad organization which can, as we all know, not only use military means, but also uh, uh, diplomatic, economic, uh, political, uh, um, law uh, uh, assistance. And uh, NATO is uh, reduced to military uh, means and uh, doing this in a very effective way. On the other hand, uh, and uh, this is one of my main points. Um, we can, as European member states, as European Union, uh, European citizen, uh, not uh, relay for all foreseeable future for uh, the support of, of third states. So, uh, as you know, as we all know, uh, for instance, uh, the, the biggest contributor to European security up to now, the, Euro the United States, uh, have also interests in, in Far East and in, in Southeast Asia. And therefore, uh, there is simple the demand that uh, the Europeans should invest more uh, and, and create more ability to defend themselves. Uh, this is again not a contradiction to NATO, but it's about what uh, is already mentioned, strengthening the European pillar of NATO, uh, strengthening uh, European armies within the European Union uh, is again uh, uh, respecting the single set of forces, strengthening the ability of both organizations to respond to crisis. So uh, to bring it, that into life, uh, we created uh, operational scenarios within the European Union, uh, which we will potentially uh, operational scenarios for crisis we will potentially face. For instance, conflict prevention, uh, evacuation, um, humanitarian aid and support, but also peace enforcement. All these scenarios are primarily related for missions abroad, so that again, this uh, sharing uh, task sharing uh, with uh, NATO is respected. That. Uh, Common defense lies uh, in the hands of the alliance in principle, and crisis response outside the continent uh, lies uh, primarily in the hands of the European Union. But once again, uh, this uh, does not release uh, European nations to invest more in security, uh, to in invest more, and it's also a demand often mentioned by, the, by US politicians that uh, European partners uh, should do more for their security and should take over more responsibility. So, as I said, we, we should assert uh, our uh, projection outside the borders, but not only political and consequently also militarily if necessary. Um, one um, uh, example uh, uh, for uh, for a new kind of mission, and I, I think uh, it's, it, it's very uh, related to the, uh, to the essence of this, uh, today's conference, is uh, the new mission, uh, the military assistance mission for Ukraine, uh, uh, which has decided uh, in, in summer this year, and has uh, 
um, envisaged to train up to 15,000 personnel uh, to replace losses uh, and also uh, to hand over uh, military equipment. So it's not only about um, uh, basic training, it's also staff training, it's uh, a training of, of uh, uh, formations um, and uh, prepare these formations um, uh, in the handling with the uh, with new and modern material, and so uh, in, encourage and uh, uh, give the chance uh, for, for Ukraine to, to have more, more success and, and additional success in the, in the uh, war against this uh, unjustified aggression, aggression by Russia. So the situation in Ukraine in particular, but also the consideration uh, that uh, come into play in the strategic compass due to previous and still other ongoing conflicts is to be mentioned here as the spearhead of European uh, uh, renovated level of ambition, the rapid deployment capacity already mentioned. So 5,000 personnel is of course not to defend the continent, it's for crisis uh, response uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the vicinity, uh, but it is an attempt to uh, strengthen the existing battle groups, also with financial incentives, but, but we know, uh, because we know that, uh, that the fact that the, the battle groups uh, haven't been used uh, since their uh, creation in, in 2004, uh, was often uh, the fact that there was no common financing and that uh, the, the use of the battle group uh, would, would, have, uh, uh, would have to be done by the, by the defense uh, budget of, of certain member states. And so we, we have to overcome this, uh, uh, these obstacles and we also enlarge the, the time, the standby time to one year and double uh, the boots on the ground. Uh, this is a, maybe seen as a small step, but for the European Union, it's, it's a big step uh, to become a more uh, robust uh, security provider in, in, the whole, uh, in the whole situation. So, um, to, uh, to, come to, uh, to, to come to some conclusions, um, uh, I would like I would like to stress uh, that uh, the Ukraine-Russian conflict uh, woke us up. Uh, it is now up to us that we implement all the decisions within the European Union systematically and uh, uh, within the foreseeable period, because we have a big time pressure, ladies and gentlemen. The war in the Ukraine obliges us to accelerate the implementation of the strategic compass, the first step towards a real European defense, to show that the European Union does not only produce documents, but also is uh, uh, able to react effectively to uh, military crisis and uh, demanding situations. So the first uh, major step uh, um, will be next year a life ex for this uh, rapid deployment capacity, uh, which will be carried out maybe possibly in, in Spain and, and uh, should demonstrate the willingness of the member states to use, to uh, make real use of these new instruments. Nevertheless, due to serious pol uh, security policy changes, it is now to strengthen the existing uh, missions, for instance, in Central Africa, uh, where uh, the crisis is ongoing. We have also uh, the mentioned Wagner Group there uh, and uh, uh, we have, uh, like uh, the North Atlantic Alliance, this uh, uh, 360 grade approach that we uh, shouldn't uh, neglect uh, necessities uh, in, in the southern sphere. As far as NATO is concerned, uh, it has the task of ensuring the collective defense, while the European Union, uh, as mentioned, will be called up to manage crisis, and this is not a contradiction. The process of collaboration will also strengthen the alliance. In summary, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, European uh, Union uh, is 
is created as a political economical project, uh, as a project pr for preserving peace, but uh, the situation demands a, a change uh, uh, of, um, uh, of our efforts and the situation demands uh, a broad strengthening uh, of, of our military ability to react. Uh, be it in the context of the alliance or be it uh, as an uh, European effort, uh, we have to take over more responsibility to, to uh, remain and, and become a credible partner for uh, European security and a contributor to uh, peace and stability in the world. Thank you. Thank you, General Prigo, very much for your presentation that gave us a picture about uh, the development and where European Union does stand and where it should go. Uh, now we do have the opportunity to ask a few questions, and I th see already a few hands. One, two, three, and then the other side, okay? Yes, please, here in the middle. Do we have a micro? Yeah, it is coming already. Uh, yes. Martin Silmeyer unfortunately had to leave, uh, but you know, in his speech, I guess he tried to answer all the possible questions <laughs> that could have come. And in so far, we can concentrate now uh, at our two speakers. Please. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for your invitation. And at first, I have a question to uh, Mr. DeSantis. So, what is your opinion uh, to the the accession of Ukraine uh, to the NATO. And the second question sorry, is... I didn't understand the question. Uh, sorry. Uh, what is your opinion on the, on the on, um, accession or membership, future membership of Ukraine uh, in the NATO? What is the membership, what my opinion on Ukraine's yeah. membership on NATO following the military aggression or in general? Uh, in general. Okay. And, and the second question is to Mr. Briga. So, in your opinion, uh, why uh, did Russian Federation agreed with the agreed with prolonging the mandate of UFO, uh, UFO Altea uh, in Bosnia? Mm -hmm. And the third question is uh, for you for you both on the uh, NATO EU uh, relationship. So there is, uh, there is still a uh, conflict. I don't understand. NATO EU? What? Uh, relationship. Liaison team? Yeah. No. Ah, relationship, sorry. Yeah, you know, I mean, sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. my age, uh, you know, it's uh, kicking in. <laughs> I can't hear very well. Uh, sorry. Okay. Yeah, because, uh, because now uh, on the topic of so-called uh, European sky shield, uh, there is some conflict between uh, Germany and France. So okay. Germany on the side on the some uh, transatlantic preference and uh, France European preference, and in this background, how will uh, how we uh, sorry how will the relationship between NATO and uh, EU develop in the future? Thank you okay. very much. Thank you. Uh, my request for the next is also to be very short. Uh, the lady over there in the. Yeah, we'll come closer. Yes, so thank you so much. Um, my question is also goes to Mr. Nicola DeSantis, and um, I would like to go back to 2008, uh, and specifically the Bucharest summit. And it was four months before Georgia was attacked by Russia, and you also mentioned this. A little bit and louder, maybe. Yes, uh, it's so. Hard for me to understand. Yes, so I'm asking a question about 2008, about the Bucharest summit, and four months later, Georgia was attacked by Russia, and so you also mentioned this. And back then, it was not Georgia, but also Ukraine, so both countries were denied on the membership action plan, basically. So this is what happened in 2008. Um, and my question would be from this perspective Would you think that this was a mistake? and more than that, strategic mistake that both countries were basically rejected on the membership action plan. Mm -hmm. And also there was stated that both countries would someday become the members of the NATO and when should we expect this? And also compared to the um, now, so to speak, attitude to like 
Sweden and Finland, we, we see like more support, even though one of the countries, I mean, Finland is, has also border with Russia. But back then, this was a sort of challenge for NATO by saying that so both Georgia and um, Ukraine are in this Eastern European area, and we don't really want to tease Russia by supporting those two countries, becoming a member of the NATO. So your reflections okay. to that, yeah. please. Thank you. Thank you. A third question, the first row. Uh, Director Hutanen here in the first row. Yeah. yeah another one is going. Grab the mic. Uh, uh, thank you. Very quickly, it's a, actually a technical question to Nicola De Santis. Two scenarios. What is the... Um, let's assume that we would have a situation in, in Europe. Let's say green men in the eastern border of, uh, of, 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 uh, of Europe or our borderline. What is the cap? Assume, let's assume, because then, as you mentioned, you need the unanimity, so everybody needs to agree on the going to Consensus. Access. Consensus, consensus. Yeah. consensus. Mm -hmm. What is the NATO capacity in the situation that one member state would say that we will, will not go for it, number one? And our second option, let's assume that, to put bluntly, uh, that one member state would be bought, would have been bought, or would be fiercely against of declaring, for example, that there is a conflict. What is the NATO's capability in that moment? Can be, there be a coalition of willing or something like that? You're talking about which kind of scenario, sorry? Yeah, well, let's say that, okay, Estonia, you start to see, yeah. uh, you know, 50 green men, some shooting. A NATO member country. You yeah, exactly. A NATO would member be, country, uh, and there would not be consensus. Exactly. That's and then the permanent representatives would be asked for the two hours okay. warning to the meeting, and then you have the discussion. And then, yeah, yeah. Uh, number one, that 40, 24, or the all except one would be in favor, but one would be fiercely against yeah. that this is not a conflict, etc. Or in general, the second scenario, let's assume that we would have a conflict that the United States, for example, would say that, okay, we understand, but this time, you know, boys, it's on your, it's for you to handle. Okay. Uh, yeah. Fourth, and then we uh, close for the second row. Please here, stay in the first row. Velina Chakarova. Uh, thank, thank you very much. A uh, question for both. Uh, um, in both strategic documents, in the compass and in the concept, China and Russia are mentioned, but separately. Mm -hmm. are, there any, are there any conversations, even if closed door, and any, <laughs> any serious analysis on the threat multiplier between China and Russia? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that goes for both. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Gentlemen, it's up to you now. Who wants to start? Do you want me to start? Are you looking at me? Okay. So I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> uh, was it a mistake? I'll, I'll answer in a different order. It's my prerogative. Yeah. I'm answering. Um, was it a mistake in 2008 not to get at the Bucharest Summit uh, membership action plan? Well, you know, you look at it uh, with the eyes of today. But you have to look at when the decision was taken. And the moment in which that decision was taken in Bucharest, and I was there, you know, we were there with uh, Yap de Obskeffer, uh, Secretary General, it was a big debate. This was a big decision. NATO deciding that a country would become a will be, we said, Ukraine will be a member without having gone through the process of the accession and the membership action plan and so forth. So here you have a very particular situation. It was taken a decision in, uh, in, Ukraine, in, uh, at, in Bucharest, at the Bucharest summit, that Ukraine will be a member country. It was taken, that decision. So to look at it, and that decision stands, by the way. Nobody should think that because of the war, there will be a reversal of this decision. There will not be a reversal. The issue will be how and when this will happen, because there is a war. But there's no going back. Now, if you look at it with the eyes of today, of course, uh, you 
can draw whatever, uh, you know, whatever conclusion. But the moment in which this decision was taken, this was a historical decision for NATO, because NATO decided that the country that hadn't gone through all the processes for membership will become a member. So for me, it was not a mistake. It was the nature of things that was, this was taken as a political decision at the highest level. Heads of state and government decide that no matter what, you know, U Ukraine would be a member of NATO. So it was not a, was not a, a, a mistake. The issue of uh, new countries coming into NATO. Now, let me be very clear. Article 10 of the Washington Treaty, the policy of NATO of open door stands, and it will be, there will be other members coming within NATO. Of course, there will have to be the conditions. There are a number of conditions to become a member, to get a, an invitation, the, the ability to contribute to Euro European security. Now, does this uh, imply that Russia feels insecure and, and so forth? Well. Why should a country feel uh, insecure when it would be surrounded by democracies, by an area of stability rather than by an area of instability? There is no justification to say that the inclusion of new members in NATO, an alliance which is based on the values of democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law, an alliance with its in, since its history in 1949 hasn't attacked anybody how, and threatened anybody, how would this not be something that would even benefit to those who are not members of NATO because the area of security and stability will be uh, extended. Now, um, the threat multiplier. Well, there are, there's a lot of discussions, you know, but of course, uh, you know, NATO is an alliance which uh, also discuss things uh, because it's a security organization. Its uh, deliberations uh, are also surrounded by a high degree of confidentiality, if, if you want me to call it this way. But of course, uh, you know, we made it clear in the strategic concept. The strategic concept, uh, Russia is defined as a threat to Euro Atlantic security. China is defined as a challenge. And so very much will depend on China, of its uh, attitude. We said it clearly, there, there's no clear, uh, uh, clarity about the real intention of, of China. We see a number of uh, actions which are, uh, again, on the same vein uh, of, of Russia. Why? Because both are trying to undermine the international rule-based order. You know, Russia wants to threaten its security militarily. <clears throat> China is trying to change the rules uh, uh, on which the international community uh, is based. So this is uh, the distinction between the two in the eyes of the allies. This was made very clear, and this remains uh, the, the policy of uh, the alliance. Now, I would be tempted not to answer your question, because it's not good for anybody who works for international organizations such as NATO to elaborate on scenario, what would happen and what would not happen. <laughs> so, you know, the, but of course I'm here, you know, what can I do? Um, <laughs> you invited me, so you know, there's not much escaping. The way I, I, I would say is this, I don't think it's realistic to think that if a member country of the alliance were attacked, that the others would not, uh, uh, you know, decide to defend the country. Uh, NATO is based on the commitment that if attack Article 5 of the Washington Treaty means that if one uh, country is attacked, the others will defend. It's a commitment. It's the, the ironclad commitment, if you want, uh, of NATO. Of course, that there is a procedure. That country will have to ask the NATO uh, Council to convene in a crisis and will have to say, I want to be defended. I don't think uh, it will ever happen that if a NATO member country were attacked, the others would not find the consensus. I think it would be quite immediate. Uh, and therefore, you know, this is also a, a lesson that it should be very clear for Mr. Putin. The resolve of the Allies to defend its members is strong. We have sent 40,000 troops to the East to testify this. We have put to a back, to a high readiness, uh, uh, our forces in the unit of more than 300,000. So it's clear what NATO would do. There shouldn't be any doubt. How do I see the future 
of NATO EU, I see this future as more and more complementary in different fields. Of course, in the security and defense field, in which uh, uh, I believe there should be a number of principles uh, that uh, remain to make uh, this partnership effective for our citizens. The first one is to avoid the duplication of existing structures and capabilities. It would not be worthwhile like, in economic terms. The second is to avoid uh, any discrimination among uh, the members of the two organizations. You know, members of NATO are members of the EU, EU but there's also a country like the United States, Canada, Norway, Turkey are not members of the EU, so there shouldn't be any di discrimination. Most importantly, the third element should be that there shouldn't be any decoupling of transatlantic security. Security of Europe and the security of North America is indivisible and it's inextricably linked in whatever scenario we will be confronted in the future. Okay. Thank you very much. Robert? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, to uh, you for Alcir uh, question, we have been very content that uh, Russia didn't raise the, the veto uh, in, uh, in prolonging the uh, mandate for, uh, for the coming year. Uh, we uh, deem it essential that uh, European Union uh, forces remain in the country uh, to contribute to, to the stability and, and to uh, uh, profitable uh, uh, development, uh, it, it goes very slowly and there are third party interests in place, not only by Russia, but also uh, by, uh, let's say, uh, parts of the Islamic world and, uh, and uh, also Far East. Uh, and so it, it's crucial to, to remain a, um, or to provide a European perspective uh, for not only Bosnia, but <coughs> all uh, Western uh, uh, Balkan countries. Uh, on new NATO relationship, uh, Mr. DeSantis, uh, I think, portrayed it uh, uh, very, uh, very precisely. Um, uh, yeah, it, it's not about uh, discriminating uh, any, uh, anybody, but I, I think uh, when we speak about burden sharing, that there it's also in the in the interest of the United States that. Uh, the, the burden, uh, uh, taking the burden, should should shift more more to Europe, and again, uh, the obligation for uh, uh, European uh, member states and allies to do more for their own for their own security. Um, China and Russia uh, mentioned uh, in in both uh, strategic documents. So so China. Uh, um, developed uh, from, uh, I, I remember uh, 20 years or 10 years ago, it was a partner, then uh, it was a competitor, now it's a challenge. Uh, I think uh, from a, a geostrategic perspective, it's uh, the far uh, more dangerous uh, element uh, compared with Russia. Uh, Russia has uh, capacities, but uh, from, a, from a broad perspective, uh, limited capacities. Uh, and uh, even the, the Ukraine uh, war uh, demonstrated that uh, the um, military ability is uh, uh, partly overestimated. But we also, on the other hand, uh, shouldn't underestimate uh, uh, the, the Russian threat. Uh, it's, uh, Currently, uh, the biggest challenge on the on the long term, I think China will be uh, uh, more more important uh, for balancing the uh, geopolitical uh, situation worldwide. So so far, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. A few more questions over there. I see three hands. Yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jan. Um, my question is for Mr. Nicola. Um, and I think that after we leave this um, forum, the most important verse that will remain in our minds will be um, collective security action um, against any kind of threat uh, rather than prioritizing 
a few countries' security concerns, right? And um, Mr. Martin mentioned, like, he left us alone, but um, if ever Austria is attacked, um, it will receive bo support uh, both from EU with the relevant clause and also from NATO with, like, physical and military aid. Um, and as a citizen of a member country of NATO, Turkey, uh, I'm sure that Turkey will be also ready to uh, support and deliver relevant and necessi necess necessary um, humanitarian aid uh, to Austria. However, like even now, um, I can observe that most of the European Union countries host and welcome international recognized terrorist organizations uh, such as PKK, YPG, YPJ, or FETO, uh, just as in the case of Finland and Sweden application to NATO because of Turkey's security concerns. Um, and I don't know, like, I have moved oh, to Vienna. Very short, please. Yeah, very sure, short. sure. Okay. okay. Uh, and I have seen, like, many flags of PKK and YPG here in Vienna in one month. And do you think that uh, NATO will, um, NATO is still functioning or in a, during a time of war breakout, do you think that it's going to lose its sincere function? Thank you. Thank you. Just the, the neighbor, immediate neighbor. Uh, yeah. Uh, two questions. First, uh, Mr. DeSantis. Yeah. Uh, in NATO, the cooperation between U.S. and the European pillar, uh, could it be that in future the U.S. is piloting to Asia more to contain China, whereas the EU is uh, become stronger in, in Europe? I remember in the global financial crisis uh, when we had the financing obligations for Central and Eastern Europe, uh, the US, we, we as Europeans, we had provided $100 billion for the IMF, and the US told us uh, Eastern Europe, it's a European problem and the Europeans should pay for it. Uh, and only after some pressure together with the Japanese, the US also provided this $100 billion. So, uh, I see them shifting to the US. And the second question to Mr. Brieger, uh, it was already mentioned with Sky Shield uh, rocket defense. Uh, should not this be one uh, European uh, endeavor, all 27 together, uh, including, for example, the UK, but potentially also Ukraine, uh, to have a, a, a rocket defense system on, on, uh, in, in Europe? And the second, uh, wouldn't it be good to have a cyber, cyber security to defend it? Because, for example, I was in the Euro system. Uh, the Federal Reserve is defended by the US uh, cyber defense, whereas the Euro system, we had to defend ourselves in cyber, which is not as efficient as you have uh, a big cyber defense uh, mm -hmm. uh, com uh, comparatively. And, uh, in Europe, we are only strong if we do it together. In trade okay. policy, we are strong, and in monetary policy, we are strong because we have Europe. Thank you. Thank you. Next. Uh, thank you very much. I have a very uh, quick question. Uh, Ukraine is also defending the European value, although they are not part of the European Union. Austria is not part of uh, NATO, but uh, Mr. Selma is not here. He left already, and he assured us that should that situation happen in Austria, I mean attacked by any country, uh, Austria, uh, NATO will defend that. My question is, uh, Ukraine is not being a NATO member. Why that n is not happening there? Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, last hand, and then we will close because uh, we will have to look forward also uh, to noon. Okay. And in the interest of lunch, I'll keep this very brief. So, um, I'm Lawrence Cattle. I focus on uh, one of my areas is EU-NATO cooperation, so this is perfect. Um, increase in defence budgets is fantastic, but duplication isn't. So, I know that EU-NATO has uh, cooperation agreements, but what specifically are you looking at in terms of re uh, making sure members don't spend on, for example, the same contractors, equipment, you know, those sort of areas? Is maybe you can enlighten us. And very briefly, specifically to uh, General Brigger, I agree with you that Europe needs to be its own security and uh, our own robust security actor. But 
Um, I'm personally a European federalist, so do you see it like I do that eventually we should move to European Air Force, Navy, Army, one budget, or do you think that it should stay relatively as it is, strengthening national uh, armed forces, but trying to decrease um, uh, duplication? Thank you very much. Okay, yes. Maybe, uh, Robert, you start this time. Uh, Thank you very much. Um, uh, to Sky uh, Shield Initiative, uh, it's as we know a German initiative, uh, including uh, a number of uh, uh, prominently Eastern uh, European uh, allies. Uh, not not France uh, for for some reasons. Uh, uh, should we have a similar uh, initiative in the EU? Uh, I, I think. Uh, we have again the single set of forces, uh, and if uh, within this initiative the uh, European sky is protected better, so uh, it's, we are all happy, um, and we, we shouldn't duplicate uh, endeavors uh, like this. Um, it, it's a first step, and uh, we, we have uh, to follow the situation, follow the development, uh, how many, uh, how many uh, uh, allies uh, will uh, participate in the future? For it's, it's again, it's a first step, and, and uh, uh, it's too early to predict uh, what what will be the end state. To cyber defense, uh, this is uh, a, a <coughs> important task. Uh, also, um, also uh, written down in the strategic compass. Uh, it's uh, when you followed uh, uh, pillar, pillar two, secure, uh, to strengthen uh, cyber defense abilities is an important uh, uh, common interest of, of, of member states, uh, not only to, uh, protect, uh, uh, to protect critical infrastructure uh, or, or uh, to, to prevent uh, blackouts, uh, but also to, to contribute to, to, military, uh, to military operations. And uh, the question, uh, why NATO do not defend <laughs> Ukraine, I, I leave uh, to, to the colleague. Uh, EU armed forces, I, I think armed forces normally, uh, I know there are exemptions in, in history, armed forces uh, normally are r related uh, uh, to sovereign states. Uh, since the EU, EU is not a sovereign state, but uh, a community of, uh, uh, of independent uh, nations, uh, we, we can only realistically uh, strive for uh, uh, bettering the cooperation, um, make the, the armed forces of the different member states interoperable, uh, um, encourage them to, to cooperate more, to work together, uh, to strengthen uh, the defense industry, uh, also a common interest, uh, not only related to, to national aspects. Uh, so this is this is the way. Uh, this is the way to uh, uh, to uh, create a better uh, European provision for for common security on the continent. Thank you. Yes, Turkey. Uh, on Turkey, uh, we, uh, I, w I will tell you uh, quite clearly, NATO is not a supranational organization, it's an intergovernmental one. So you need uh, the agreement of all the governments, uh, you know, when a decision has to be adopted. And of course, country, this is an alliance of values, but it's also an alliance of interest. So the interests of all allies have to be taken into account when decisions are, are taken. Uh, but I am confident that there is work now in order to address the concerns uh, Turkey has, and I'm confident that uh, a solution will be find, found. Do you, uh, the U.S. Uh, pivoting to Asia, we've been he listening, hearing this for a long time, and it seems to me the United States are very much engaged in Europe and in European security, especially during this crisis. The EU is the major trading partner of uh, the United States, so I don't see how that uh, pivot will, will replace this, especially now that China is taking a number of initiatives. What I think uh, the, the U.S. is doing, like also NATO is doing, it's strengthening its partnership with countries uh, in, in that region. And I wouldn't draw re really a parallel between what happens in multilateral 
financial organizations and what happens in security. Security is a, is a business vital, you know, because it really, it's the lives of people. And, and I have no doubt uh, of that the United States will continue to be engaged in Europe because Europe is also the destiny of the United States as much the destiny of North America as the one of Europe. Now, the issue of uh, that you pose about uh, defending Austria, I, I didn't do that, so I didn't say that, so <laughs> the question should have been addressed to somebody else. But let me be very clear. <laughs> Article 5 of the Washington Treaty is for members, it's not for partners. So the alliance will defend, and I have no doubt, and nobody should have a doubt, that it will defend the member country if attacked, but uh, the alliance is not... Uh, 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 defending countries which are not members. This is very clear in the treaty since the 4th of April 1949. This is the policy of the alliance, so we'll continue to be this one. Okay, so uh, before coming to an end, I just want, uh, of Sorry, course. can I compliment this? But it's also true that by developing what I mentioned before, I, I told you that together with the deterrence and defense, one of the core security tasks uh, of uh, the alliance is cooperative security. Through cooperative security partnerships, we are also helping countries develop the defense capacity to resist an armed attack. We are sharing knowledge, we're sharing expertise, training, you know, the way in which uh, capabilities are used. I mean, it's because this partnership with Ukraine, that today Ukraine, with the help uh, of NATO member countries, is in a position to resist and repel the Russian Federation's army. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much for uh, also speaking this out very clearly. I think there are not so many people who really think that NATO will be the organization for raising pickets uh, so far. Uh, of course, you have to be aware whether you are a member or you are not. And this, of course, uh, will more or less uh, define not only the frame of your own activities, but also of the shield you will get uh, if it is necessary. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I just want to announce uh, that at, after lunch at 4.30 p.m., we will have our think tank panel in the same room. We will regroup it, and we will have the chance, you know, uh, well, to talk about Europe's global role following Russia's war against Ukraine. And this question of what really will be Europe's role will be quite interesting. And as we announced already, we will have four highly interesting speakers coming from, think, uh, from different think tanks. On the one hand, it's Roland Freidenstein from Jobsec, uh, his vice president over there, extremely experienced and also having an extreme network also to, uh, to the transatlantic organizations. On the other hand, we have Peter Hefele. Uh, he is the policy director uh, of Wilfred Martens Institute in Brussels. He also has, from his personal experience, uh, a background in Eastern Asia, so he can talk a little bit also about uh, China and other uh, uh, challenges. We have Céline Maranger uh, from the Institut de Recherche Stratégique de l'École Militaire. Uh, you can see uh, this will be also a French contribution. And we have Jamie Shear. Most of the people here in the room probably have been experienced him uh, in the last decades, not centuries, decades, <laughs> uh, as one of the most fervent speakers. And it will be moderated by Velina Chakharova. So you can be sure it will be a very lively uh, session uh, with quite some spirit uh, to look uh, in, into the future. And one interesting aspect, it also combines representative, two of them, to have a German uh, origin, one a French origin, and one a British one. So far, you can experience Europe 
as it is, you know, with all uh, the differences. And insofar, it will be a very highly interesting session. So, now coming to an end, uh, we will walk over now and have a lunch uh, in the neighboring room. But before we do that, I really want to give a big, big hand. I want to thank for the first part of our European Forum, not only to the two speakers that are uh, that just had the panel now, Nicola and that Robert, but also uh, for our guests from Ukraine. We really were proud that you came. It was an experience for everybody. And I think uh, to understand what is going on, it was extremely uh, fruitful to have you here. Thank you so much. Big hand to all our speakers. <laughs>